And of the of you, how many are actually using our new account system? You know, one password, families, teams, individuals versus just the local clients. Okay, zero. Anyway, uh, so I'm going to be talking about what you're not yet using. Um, and this should go into view, single page. Um, so uh, in a sense, I'm continuing on my previous two PasswordsCon talks. A year ago, I spoke about what we're now calling two secret key derivation. And I will try to very briefly review that without going into the details of the actual key derivation. While a year ago, it was all about the key derivation. Um, uh, but as you'll see, it means that the user has a master password. And the user has a secret that is stored more or less unencrypted on their own devices. And these two get fed into the local key derivation process. Um, and uh, in Las Vegas, I talked about how we present this two-secret key derivation. It's a very new thing for users. Uh, people don't know what to make of it. And it was sort of a discussion of are we doing a good enough job of setting people up so that they treat these other things uh, correctly? And um, uh, uh, as you'll see, this actually leads into what I'm talking about today, which is how we do recovery within something that is genuinely end-to-end -end encryption. OK, so uh, these are actually me cribbing my slides from last year. We make a password manager. Um, and until about a year ago, we never held on to any data. Now we do. Um, and uh, I'm going to just informally say what I mean by account recovery here. So if somebody has a 1Password account, uh, they will be a member of a team or a family. And I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to use the language and terminology that we use for 1Password teams. Uh, so uh, um, Morgan is a member of a team. Uh, and through her knowledge of her master password and her access to her account key on her local device, um, she has the capacity to do various things with her data. Let's just say decrypt her data um, that she can fetch from the server. Um, uh, Morgan forgets her master password or either loses the account key. You know, the only copy of it gets trashed through a disk crash or something like that. Um, and then recovery is a thing. And after that, she is restored to state one. So that's what I mean by account recovery in this case. And then, of course, a lot of stuff goes in in that account recovery thing. And that's what I'll be hitting on the second, <laughs> second part of this. Um, uh, as we just heard, and I think we're all familiar with, is that, um, is that password reset procedures the authentication of them is, um, is inherently weaker than the actual authentication system in general. Um, these can often be reset by help desks who are, who are subject to social engineering or any other kinds of tricks like that. Um, and in a sense, if you've got the capacity to do such a reset, then you don't really have end-to-end -end encryption um, so, uh, you know, so, so recovery mechanisms are very scary. And my watch is making way too much noise. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so from a purely security point of view, if you ignore data availability, I'd rather simply not have a recovery mechanism at all. And just, uh, 
you know, I, I want to make it clear from the beginning before I work through how this whole thing works is that we do have truly end-to-end -end encryption and the way that we have recovery is that we delegate the capacity to perform uh, recovery to the owners or managers of the teams or families that get set up. And I'm gonna collapse a whole bunch of different roles um, because teams can have a complex sets of roles. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk about the owner of a, of a team or the organizer of a family and they are the ones who have a, the capacity to perform recovery for uh, members of that family, members of that team. Um, and, uh, but we do not have that capacity. Um, okay, and the usual reasons for wanting a recovery system is that the kinds of data that you store in something like a password manager and general documents store, you secure document store and all the things that you can do in one password and similar is it's catastrophic if you lose that, or it certainly can be. Um, data, you know, as another conversation I had here a couple days ago was that, um, you know, without data availability, confidentiality and integrity doesn't mean anything. You need to actually be able to do stuff with your data. And the other thing, of course, is that we couldn't actually sell anything to businesses if we didn't offer some kind of recovery mechanism. Uh, we have an unusual, and I have to be careful not to unplug things. Um, we have some, an unusual extra need for recovery which is really that we have a, an extra way that people can lose their ac access. That is, they need both their master password and this account key thing um, to be able to derive the keys that are necessary to decrypt or, and authenticate to our system. And therefore, they've got new ways to get completely frozen out of their data. Um, uh, and just, I want to give a little background. This is, some of this is just a repeat of what I talked about last year, but without going into the technical details of how the key derivation works. Um, but the rationale for why, we, why did we cause ourselves all this trouble with this two secret key derivation and this other thing that people lose is, it's a usability issue, it's a data, avail a data availability issue. Um, and so just a little bit about authentication to a service. Um, with a traditional username password, site authentication, every time you log in, you're actually sending your credential, your password to the server, which then gets processed, so you're actually transmitting your authentication secret. Um, and uh, you've got other problems. It doesn't authenticate the server to the client. And the whole thing is replayable. And there are lots of other attacks that can be done on a typical, um, um, on, a, on just your typical login stuff, which I assume most people are familiar with. A solution to almost all of the problems are uh, password, authenticate, uh, password authenticated key exchange mechanisms. The one that we use is called SRP, Secure Remote Password. And I'm not going to describe how those work. Um, and uh, you actually can just sleep during this. Um, because I'll get to the, to the main point afterwards. Um, you know, but during registration, uh, the client will calculate something. And it, so it will, it will calculate, uh, and here I'm talking about SRP, it will calculate something that's been creatively called X. Um, so the SRP X, and this is a client secret that uh, that the client has or can derive from 
local password key derivation stuff. Um, and from the, from the X, the client computes a V, a verifier. And this verifier is what gets sent to the server on first registration. And because we're going to have clients logging in or connecting from different places, uh, we can't store the salt purely locally. The salt has to go to the server so it can pass that down to new clients trying to connect. Okay, um, now during the actual authentication, uh, it's really nice. Um, uh, the client derives its X from its various secrets. Um, eh, the client and server do a little bit of Diffie-Hellman-like um, exchange and dance and stuff like this. <laughs> and because of the, the mathematical relationship between the server's verifier and X, um, the client proves to the server that it knows X without sending any secrets and without sending anything replayable. Uh, the server proves to the client that it knows the verifier V, so you get mutual authentication. Um, this whole thing is done in a non-replayable way and a session key is also generated so you encrypt the rest of the session with something derived during this authentication process uh, so that you can have um, a much more secure transport, um, uh, another layer of transport security. Um, the main thing is that a PAKE does a lot of really wonderful things that solve an enormous problem with just login security. Um, but that verifier is attackable in the same way that a password hash is attackable. It's not a password hash, but if an attacker gets that verifier and the salt and knows the algorithms, which of course are actually specified out in our white paper, um, then the attacker can run password guesses, go through our whole local key derivation process, see if generate an X, generate the V from the X, see if it's the same, and if they've made the right <coughs> guess, then they'll get the same V. So it can be used in the same way uh, that a hash could be used in um, uh, uh, in terms of cracking, so um, the V is no worse than what we have, you know, than, than what we have, but it's no better either. Um, and of course, in our key derivation process, we use a ton of PBKDF2 and all of those sorts of things that you're supposed to do. Um, uh, but this, um, this again isn't really enough. We have to perform all of that key derivation, that, or that's all performed by the user's client. And so we're computationally bound by whatever the user has in their pockets. And, um, and in terms of algorithms and systems, uh, we're bound by having to actually have this work on all of our client platforms. So we're still stuck with PBKDF2, even though there are better successors. Um, uh, and we do, um, what is it? I think at the moment it's 100,000 rounds uh, with HMAC um, SHA-256. So, you know, it's not bad. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about things like a 50-bit password you know, or password with 50 bits of strength. And uh, here I'm actually quoting from my first uh, passwords con talk. Don't need to actually know this because I also haven't given you the definition of gamma. Um, but the general idea is you take 
the average number of guesses given a distribution of passwords to find a particular password um, with a 50% probability. So you've got basically, it's like guessing entropy. You, you're counting up how many guesses it takes to have a good chance of guessing a password. And then you're just taking the base two logarithm of that count to get it all nicely in bits so you can compare it with the other things that we do. Um, so that's what I mean when I talk about the strength of a password uh, in what follows. Now, uh, 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 I, uh, okay, look, he's American, so I don't have to give a French pronunciation. Uh, uh, Bonau and Schachter did a nice little preliminary thing at the beginning of a paper where they actually made estimates of cost to crack by looking at the total results of Bitcoin mining in 2013. Um, and, you know, and these are extremely rough, broad estimates, you know, necessarily. But, uh, but they came up with a figure of about a million dollars um, for uh, two to the 70 cryptographic operations. Um, if a slow hash, if something like our PBKDF2 or just guessing a password is more computationally expensive than performing a single hash operation or, um, uh, or testing a particular AES key or something like that, um, if testing a password is, is a million times slower than uh, testing a single hash or testing a single um, AES key or something like that, because you're also generating your guesses and all of that computation, then that adds an effective 20 bits. Um, and if we just take Moore's law, from their 2013 estimate, um, uh, we'd say that uh, computation is four times <laughs> cheaper today. So, uh, so what this means is that a well-hashed password, you know, something with good, strong, you know, use of argon, bcrypt, whatever, um, needs a strength of more than, than 52 bits um, to, to kind of be at the edge of a million dollar um, attack. Um, so we're, you know, we're adding the 20 bits of effective strength through the slow hashing, gets us 72, but we've taken off two bits for the difference between now and 2013. Okay, so at a, Oh, at another PasswordsCon talk, I talked about our word list, our diceware-like system, and the words that we've developed. It's approximately 18,400 words, uh, word list, so a passphrase uh, from that word list that has just three words in it is approximately 42 bits. One that's four words is approximately 56 bits, and uh, one that's five words is approximately 70 bits, and then using these estimates, the cost of cracking those is about $1,000 for the three, uh, for the three word one, tens of millions for the four word one, and astronomical for five words. Um, now, in our user interface, when people sign up, we encourage, we default to showing them, to, for generating for them four word passwords. But we suspect <coughs> that most people either choose their own passwords or, um, or go down to three words instead of four words. Um, and so, we don't have data on this. Obviously, we don't know how strong our customers' master passwords are. 
because if we could have that information, that would actually be a bad thing. Um, uh, or the capacity to gain that information would be a bad thing. Um, but it's safe to assume that a substantial portion of our customers will have master passwords that are under 42 bits and therefore crackable on the order of $1,000. Um, so you've got your service. Um, you know, and, you know, and we're worried about, of course, insider attacks. We're worried about your traditional hacking attack. And of course, there are attacks via subpoena or legal structure. And, you know, I mean, normally I just list those three and don't say anything. But, you know, I mean, us hackers, we talk about these really bizarre hypothetical situations. You know, things that, you know, you, you know just abstract worst case things like, as a hypothetical, if like a thin-skinned, erratic narcissist with no sense of civil liberties uh, were to just somehow come to control the world's most powerful surveillance apparatus, <coughs> you may be a little bit concerned about whether you are storing on your servers uh, stuff that would be valuable to such an entity. So, uh, we're basically cowards, and we don't want to store such information. So, uh, so this is why we introduced the two-secret key derivation that I talked about last year, where you've got a high entropy user secret that is stored on their machines, and, um, and uh, that means that data captured from us um, is, you know, that, those, that the verifiers that we store, that the verifiers and the salts that we store are insufficient to launch a plausible password cracking attack. The attacker would also need to get this thing that we call an account key from, uh, from the user system. So that's why we introduced the account key, but as I said, and to actually get back to where we're, where we're going, um, uh, the account key increases the possibility of people getting themselves locked out. So that compelled us to do, um, that compelled us to really have to have some kind of recovery system and to explain how our recovery system works, I need to describe a lot of the internal keys and structures used within 1Password uh, for teams or families. Um, so when a person creates their account, um, they, you know, their client generates a public-private key pair. Um, we call this the personal key set. And, um, and the private part, the secret part of that key is encrypted with something that's derived from their account keys and, and master password. So we've got these personal key sets, those public private key pairs. Uh, data is stored in vaults in our terminology. Um, so particular items, so one password item. Uh, you will have a vault with multiple items. Um, again, just very briefly, the, um, all of our controls are in terms of vaults, and every item within a vault is encrypted with that vault's vault key, which is a symmetric key. Um, and so when you create a vault, you also generate the symmetric key for that vault, and when you add someone to that vault, when you share the vault with them, you encrypt the vault key with the recipient's public key. Okay. Now, then there's something that is entirely, or that is largely invisible to users. Um, uh, these are groups, and a group 
also has something like a personal key set, but it's not a person, it's a group, so we need another name for it, but we don't talk about it that much, so we don't actually have a name for it. Let me call it the group key set. Um, and, and, but a group behaves, uh, but things will be encrypted with the group's public key. Um, and then the people who are able to decrypt the, the, um, the secret key for the vault are the members of that vault. Uh, so they can decrypt, so, so the secret key for a vault is encrypted with Bob's public key. Bob can decrypt, um, decrypt that, get the, get the secret key for the vault, and then get anything that is encrypted with the vault's public key. Man, I hate this stuff. Okay, I hope that was all perfectly clear. Um, okay, but that, all of that about groups was to introduce the notion of a special group called the recovery group. Um, it is created when a team family is created, so the owner or organizer of the team uh, uh, gets, the, gets the private key for, um, uh, for the recovery group. Um, the owner can add people to the recovery group by, you know, again, it's sending, it's sending the private key, sending the secret key to the recover, of the recovery group to, to the, and encrypting that with a public key of whoever they're adding to it. Um, but unlike other groups, the server does not deliver uh, the, the encrypted vault keys. Um, held by the group except under special circumstances. So, so those things are not sent to the client um, normally. Okay. So at the beginning of the process, uh, Bob is the team owner. I know this is Bob and Carol, I originally had a more complicated layout. Um, Bob is the owner. Um, the, uh, the, uh, secret key sub R is the secret key belonging to the recovery group, and that gets encrypted with Bob's public key, so Bob has that. Carol joins, um, so she generates a vault key, I and mean, she also generates other, you know, personal key set. And of course, people will have multiple vaults, but Caesar just uses one. She generates vault keys. She encrypts her items um, uh, with that vault key. That's actually a fairly, that's a process that's spelled out elsewhere. I'm just doing that as one line here. And she sends to the server her encrypted data um, and uh, but she is also sending to the server the, um, uh, her vault key encrypted with the public key of the recovery group. And to see, Bob has the, uh, has the ability to, right, okay. <laughs> Let me just continue. And now it gets worse. Okay, so uh, Carol has decided, Carol has informed uh, Bob through some other mechanism that she has forgotten her master password, lost her account, key, needs account recovery, and, uh, and, so, and so Bob um, authenticates to the system and clicks a start recovery for Carol thing, which sends instructions to Carol to her email. So email is very much part of the recovery process. Um, and uh, what these instructions, and it also changes the state of Carol's account on the system, uh, 
basically have Carol go through a repeat of the initial sign-on procedure. It looks a little different. There are fewer things she has to do, but she gets a new account key. Again, that's generated by the client. She picks a new master password, and, uh, uh, but she is generating a new public key set. And so a, a new personal key set, she's sending her public key, her new public key to the server. When the server receives her new public key, when she's completed that process, um, it sends a notice to Bob saying, okay, now you can go through the complete recovery step. Um, and when Bob clicks on that uh, complete recovery, then, uh, then the server will send um, uh, the, the vault keys, blah, Carol's vault keys encrypted with the recovery, that, that were encrypted with the recovery keys, public key. Oh man, this stuff is really, is, is anybody, is this actually useful for anybody or should I just say it works? Um, you have 60 minutes, Jack. So, uh. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, so Bob's client now and only now, that is after Carol went through her process and her steps, um, uh, only now get the um, get the keys to her vault um, that are encrypted to the recovery group's um, public key. <coughs> and since Bob has um, has the secret key for the recovery group, he can decrypt that, get Carol's old vault key, um, and then he re-encrypts it with Carol's new public key and sends, um, and so sends to the server Carol's old vault key, um, now re-encrypted with Carol's new public key, and the server We'll send that and that vault data to Carol, who can now decrypt her vault key, the old vault key, um, uh, using her new public key, and can then use that to actually decrypt the vault or the items in the vault and get her data. So there are a couple things to note about this. Um, and these are things that are enforced by the server. So you know, not fully cryptographically enforced, which would be better, but it's what we had to do. Um, so a member of the recovery group will not be granted to the encrypted data in a vault that they otherwise wouldn't have access to. Um, so, so if Carol has a vault, let's call it her personal vault, that Bob should not normally have access to, um, while during this process, his client does get that vault key. Um, uh, he's not actually given the data for that vault. So the server uh, won't transmit to uh, to him, the, the data in that vault. Um, the, uh, a member of the recovery group will only be sent the encrypted vault keys after the user requesting recovery has recreated their account. That is, so Carol has to get the notification to here's your next step in what to do for recovery. And so, so she gets that notification. She has to act on it 
and regenerate her stuff, and only then will the server send Bob the vault key that's encrypted um, with the group public key. Um, if, um, if the user successfully authenticates um, prior to the com completion of this recovery, the whole recovery thing is canceled and the server won't send Bob anything. So uh, that is if, if Carol thought that she forgot her master password, requested recovery, or of course if somebody fake requested recovery, um, uh, once she actually successfully logs in before any complete recovery thing, we know that she doesn't actually need the recovery. Um, uh, okay, so uh, the biggest and most obvious attack on this is that, um, sorry, Chena is my uh, kind of problematic dog. Very, very sweet under the right circumstances. Um, and Morgan is just a very sweet dog. Um, anyway, if Chena is a member of the recovery group for, for <coughs> A team with Morgan as a member, then if Chena can intercept and tamper with Morgan's email, then, okay, sorry, I really, these slides, forget my spelling. I can't spell. Then Chena has the power to take over Morgan's account. Um, so if uh, if the notification, if the email of here are the steps to do to, uh, to, um, you know, to Carol or to Morgan are intercepted by Chena and not actually delivered to Morgan, then Chena can go and recreate Morgan's account with, um, uh, with her own account key, master password, and then we'll, we'll be able to do a complete takeover. Um, but again, this is a capacity that is limited to the particular team or organization. So it's a power that, um, uh, that you know, let's say widgets co uses one password for teams, they set things up, their account owner or various administrators have this capacity to, uh, to take over individual accounts within it. Okay, um, so we have some general advice for, um, for organizations that do this. Um, Members of the recovery group should be adept at keeping the devices that they use secure and free of malware. Uh, they should be aware of social engineering. We uh, encourage them to verify requests for recovery through something other than email, you know, to use some other channel of communication as appropriate for their organization. We don't know their organization. Um, oh, right, that was my next point, okay. Uh, you should be aware of email attacks. Um, and if the last member of a recovery group gets run over by a bus, that's it. Um, uh, you, no one else can be added to the recovery group because nobody has the, the secret key for the recovery group. Um, and, um, <coughs> And then you just have to make sure that people don't forget their master passwords or lose their account keys. Okay. Um, and so I'll actually finish where my... So I've... Um, uh, in Las Vegas, I just kind of presented what this process looked like to the user. I can play the five-minute video of that and have one minute for questions, or I could skip that video and have six minutes for questions. With questions. 
Okay, two questions. I'm going with the video. Um, Okay, so that's Chena. When you see her picture, this is what she's doing. Um, you know, so she's received a request out of band from Morgan to recover. Um, she does a begin recovery. And so all this is doing is setting the server in a particular state uh, to watch logins and sends a, you know, and, and informs Morgan what she needs to do. Um, Morgan then goes through something that's like our initial thing. She gets assigned a, um, an account key. This is also stored uh, by the browser if she's using the web client. And I, you have to see the talk from the summer to understand what we do to make sure people don't lose account keys. Um, uh, she picks a master password. And now, so at this point, she's created a new personal key set. And uh, her new public key has been sent to the server. Um, and so now we're back to Chena, who gets notified to complete the recovery. Chena logs in again and simply presses a complete recovery button. But that is, but that is where she is getting uh, Morgan's old vault keys, um, decrypting with the recovery group key, and then re-encrypting. And now Morgan can sign in again. And her precious data that she created earlier in a different set of videos that were used in that talk. Um, all right, sorry. I, this is one of the ways we encourage people to not lose their account keys, uh, is we actually encourage people to print this thing out. This is, again, it's all generated client side. Um, and there we go. She has her precious data back again. And that's the, just about something else anyway. OK, so uh, questions. <clears throat> <clears throat> 